It's day. It's a Thursday. It doesn't feel like it, it. it's a Thursday. It's Thursday, April twenty third. The first week. Uh, the first Thursday of the. Uh, this was supposed to be the first first Thursday Jazz Fest. Yeah, which is kind of weird. I was actually really looking forward to um, not being in town at the start. We were going to play the four twenty Fest in Atlanta, but I was excited to have the bus ride in to New Orleans smack dab in the middle of jazz fest because it's never done. I don't I don't know if I was excited. I was it it was gonna be really weird because we were gonna be playing floor twenty fest. Uh we were supposed to play on Saturday, right? Like this upcoming Saturday? We were playing Friday. Cause Friday. The, okay. uh you had a show in Huntsville was supposed to be the twenty first and I think we had two days off into uh 420 and then yeah the next day would be our fairground set yeah so i think today was going to be the lyric in oxford and then that's a good spot <laughs> yeah and then uh and then yeah it would have been 420 fest and then we would have played 420 fest in atlanta got on the bus slept on the bus as it drove to new orleans and woken up on the bus behind the Acura stage at Jazz Fest I and had to leave the site to go shower at our houses. Yeah. Maybe it was the fact that it was something new and different all the while still performing and playing the same. Yeah. So that was something I was looking for. I'm sure we'll hopefully get that opportunity again. Yeah. It, it's it's going to be weird. But it is cool that I'm seeing a lot of these um, – particular vendors are offering food that they sell during jazz fest to people right now. So I, I saw like the crawfish bread is already sold out. It's, it's, really? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, and I don't know if a lot of people in town are necessarily buying it or it's getting put into dry ice and getting sent places. But I think people are trying to get that little slice of jazz fest still if they can't. Because, you know, you can listen to OZ right now, and what would be better than having, like, a Cochandele po' boy listening to, like, a Reber set on OZ? Yeah, I mean, I I would listen to OZ this morning, and it was, like, it was nice. Although it is, it was rainy this morning, so it would have been a rainy jazz fest morning. It was. It's kind of, I was talking to somebody yesterday about the weather pattern and how it's kind of changed where those first few years we were in town – it could have been absolutely brutal every single day of Jazz Fest. And I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, I started noticing that it wasn't as hot and the oppressive heat wasn't there consistently every day the way it was for years, where it would just be hot or torrential downpour. So I don't know if it's uh, – obviously there's some global – didn't go on the right day, my friend. <laughs> it's been hot. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just – it feels different. I feel like it should be a lot warmer in town right now than it is. Yeah, it's it's really weird. Jazz Fest is this huge thing. It, we all leads up to it, and it just feels right now like a regular Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> Except, you know, but we are trying to get, you know, people are ordering the crawfish bread. I'll probably try to find some, like, catfish merlaton if they're still making that. That's your favorite? That's like your favorite? Yeah, the, uh, the what is it, pecan-crusted catfish and merleton casserole and the crab cakes. That's I, my favorite. I don't remember who I was talking to about this, but the food is all great, but it's not exactly something you'd want to eat before performing. No, no, no. Yeah, so uh, when we – Yeah, when we used to uh, play earlier in the day, it would be like, all right, you – eat a big breakfast, you play your set in the afternoon, and then after your set's done, you go get food. But now it's like by the time our set's done and we're all packed up, we're just like, we're lucky. It's like, do I go see one of these bands that I really want to see? Or, or do I, you know, go get food? My decision is not to go get food and to just come back the next day and get food. <laughs> you know what? I do know people that go with specific days in mind where one of the days is food is the number one agenda over the music. And that's kind of the beauty of it is you can make your own way there and do what you want. Cause they're, I put it this way. I don't think I've tried half of the food that they have there. I've had a lot of it, but there's just so many options and it's, 
really out of this world. And some yeah. of my favorite stuff is uh, I can only get there because I'm not necessarily going to drive all the way to Natchitoches to get gumbo, even though I have it every day. You're there and I love it. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's it's weird. Do you uh you got any good jazz fest memories from uh from the food or the other bands you've seen? What I, I have a question. What was the first jazz fest you went to and what did you do there? Jazz fest I went to must have been in two thousand and six when I was a freshman in Loyola. Uh I I think Dave Matthews was one of the headliners that I saw. That one sticks out. And then I don't know if you ever worked at the the t shirt stand. Never did the t shirts. So yeah, for a lot me, Andrew and Mike went to the same uh, university in uh, Loyola University and some of their music industry <laughs> uh, they had a connection to where a bunch of kids could work at Jazz Fest. So you would pick a half day shift. And then the next half of the day, you could either go watch music or you are inside the festival. So I got to see a lot of great stuff that way. One particularly, a Neil Young set sticks out in my mind. I think it was my junior or senior year. That was probably my first moment where I realized I wanted to stay here after college. Yeah, for me, it was, I think it was 2005 was my first year. I don't remember who was playing, you know, they all kind of jumbled together now, but the first year I worked the CD tent, uh, it was like the sister tent to the T-shirt. Yeah. I think when Basin street records was running the CD tent. And then, uh, every year after that, I worked, uh, for jazz fest live doing the live recordings. I'd be like underneath the stage or on the side of the stage and like this tiny corner, uh, patching in and recording all the shows. And then during the breaks, I'd get to go see music. And are those shows that you were recording for, were those the ones that were put on like the official Jazz Fest sampler CD? Or were these going live feed to OZ? They're the one. So there's this company uh, called Monk Mix. And they, I'm going to, hold on, I just got brighter outside. I'm going to turn my camera down. Yeah, it's fine. Do, do. All right. I think there we go. Uh, there's this company called Monk Mix. They, I think, made their bread and butter doing recording and doing like CDs right after the show of Grateful Dead shows. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. Uh, and or maybe it was Almond, Bro- maybe it was Almond Brothers. I can't remember. Um, but they they have a partnership with Jazz Fest, and you know it's the Jazz Fest Live part of it so there's a tent you can go to at jazz fest and you can buy cds of performances at the festival like sometimes the afternoon after that set sometimes like the next day so i think pearl jam was the first artist i heard who was able to get that to you as you were walking out almost of the show i don't know if it was a download code it had to have been a code it couldn't have just been a a cd at that point there are a couple things like you had these like you had these like big racks of CD burners. And as soon as like it was mixed and it was ready to go and you'd like, you know, whether sometimes you can do it live. So like the minute the set's done, it's done. Sometimes you like get it and then you like do a mix on it and then release it like in a couple hours. But if you do it live and it's done, then you just put the CD into the seat master CD burner. And then in like five minutes, you have like 20 CDs, 10 minutes, you got 40 CDs. Or you you had like little USB thumb drives where you could duplicate it instantly. Yeah. But uh, wild. I, there's also something to be said of trying. If I just witness an incredible concert and they're almost instantaneously offering me that package while I'm leaving, you're probably more inclined to buy it right then than maybe like a week later. Not that you wouldn't, because a lot of people end up using some of those sites like Nugs and everything to listen to live. Yeah. It's cool that you were. Uh, you were doing that as a college kid. And like you said, if you were under the stage means you were out of the heat for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Some, some stages they would give you a little corner and some stages you'd be on the side. You just have to like, well, you just have to be out of the way of everything else. But some stages like the Acura stage, for instance, some days there's no room on the stage. And so you're literally under the stage on some pieces of plywood. So you like your rig doesn't get all muddy. 
recording these shows. People that have never uh, been behind a stage in a major festival, you'll notice sometimes on these stages, that's where all the riggers and the various stage hands and stuff will hang out. So you'll even see um, tents and canopies and hammocks and stuff hung up under there, which is- Yeah. Well, because some of these guys, like the crews that work to put on this stuff, like they get there, you know, super early in the morning, they stay there super late at night. And so, like, once a lot, the the guys that are, like, the setup and teardown crews, um, they're a lot of the bulk of their work is at the beginning and the end of the festival. But then they have to be on site in case anything breaks or they have to adjust something mid, mid-set. mid But when the sets are on, if nothing is breaking, you know, they've maybe got two hours of sleep. So you go in a little, little hammock, you, you know, get a little Z's while you listen to Stevie Wonder right above your head. I think that was one of the coolest memories I had getting there early one year. Um, I think we used to get there at like eight or nine in the morning to start setting up for this stuff. Um, And Stevie Wonder was in the middle of his sound check. So I got to, yeah, I, uh, I got to hear him sound check. It was just amazing. It, you know, he was up there with the whole band. Um, They were running tunes. They were having fun. It was great. Now, Mike, this is, you're still in college at this point when you're doing that. Yeah. Because I know you had also worked for Ray Haj, who at the time was producing Voodoo. And how did that come about? Because obviously that's kind of in the same world and meshing. It's just seasonal stuff at that point. Yeah, it, it's really weird because I had two completely different roles with these two organizations. Like uh, for Jazz Fest, I was audio. I was working recordings. I was recording. I was mixing some of the li- these live shows um, for this little ancillary thing that was both an archival purpose and like, uh, you know, something that people could buy there. And then for Ray Haj, I was doing something completely different. I think the first year I worked, actually the first two or three years I worked, I was just a worked on the stages as like a stagehand assistant. And then one year someone was like, Hey, does anyone know how to like wire, uh, like land cables? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I did that. Me and my dad, wired our house together um, one summer. Um, So I started doing that and then suddenly I became the IT guy. (laughs) And I did, was in charge of like IT and uh, the live streaming videos and you know, stuff year round for them, which was really, really fun. Tell me if I'm wrong, at that point, the the live streaming stuff was pretty new. It's not where it is at now where you can have- Yeah. incredible sound but it it's uh it's really moved along quite well in the past decade no it it really like you know internet bandwidths uh you could always kind of pay a bunch of money and get enough bandwidth to send a really high quality stream to the internet but then people wouldn't have enough bandwidth to pull that down and view it live and like 1080p or 4k so when we did it um at voodoo one of the things we we did, we were, uh, I think, one of the first uh, festivals to do a full 1080p stream. So most people are like 1080p, that's like normal. That's like just regular definition. Like now we're used to 4K, we want 4K streaming. But at that time, like we were putting out this 1080p stream and like only about an eighth of the people who were watching it had enough bandwidth to pull down the 1080p stream. Most of them were watching like a, 720 or a 540 stream is dead. TV back here is 4K, and there's sometimes when I'm trying to watch signals coming from England that are soccer, and the 4K still isn't up to snuff in 2020. So yeah. like, it'll be a constant thing. I'll have to worry about my entire life is the clarity of picture versus it being able to be viewed how I want it to. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're 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 in this midst of this thing right now where. Uh, you know, everything is going to streaming. So I've been working a lot on like relearning about this stuff that I used to know about all this broadcast streaming and all this new software you can use to stream from your house and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, you know, all it, it's really cool though, that festivals for a while, like were really good about putting all this stuff on the internet for you, you to watch if you weren't able to attend the festival. And let's hope that we could all be attending a festival Oh, yeah. No. Oh, you lost me for a second. Give me one second. Let's cut to, let's cut to there. 
screen too. Yeah, my my camera setup's a little new, so uh, nothing but time to try and make. <laughs> yeah, so I this is this is the webcam on my laptop, and then this is my DSLR, which works great, except it shuts off every twenty minutes until I get a little power adapter for it, which is in the mail. <laughs> And obviously you've been working on some of this technology based stuff and obviously you can see in the background you have a plethora of keyboards set up oh yeah anything else that you've been utilizing during this time that you might have neglected before or was procrastinating against is there just something that you've been really focusing in on or just nothing for that matter because there's no I, wrong. i've been getting through more of the baby books <laughs> So we, when we were on the road, I had, uh, I'm curious, we can do, we can, this is a good, this is a good segue. Uh, right now. Yeah, George, George and I are both expectant fathers, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and when we were on the road, I, I brought some, you know, expectant father dad books on with, uh, on the road with me, but didn't really have that much time to uh, read them. <laughs> But uh, I've been getting through them. What's what's your what what books have you read so far, George? I want to say all the books I've had have been gifts from somebody, and some of them have like a a uh, kind of like a comedic tint. Where one, I think, for instance, is called "Raising a Baby in the Zombie Apocalypse" or something along those lines, where they're trying to have you the information so it isn't so academic. I would say. Yeah. But then the flip side of that too is. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what a snoo is. The, it's a, it's essentially like a motorized baby swaddler that it was built by this, uh, I think this doctor from Vancouver who's like the baby whisperer. And we actually have one of his DVDs. I'll be sure to, to let you borrow it after. And his breakdown is that the baby is literally has four trimesters. So the baby is still technically in a fetus mode for the first three months it's actually born. So That's an interesting point. If you treat the baby like it's still in the fetus with different techniques, you can have them stop from crying pretty instantaneously. Or at least the DVD makes it seem like that. And from my internet research, it seems to be like it works pretty well. So I'm going to be uh, really upset if I'm shushing and jostling my baby. <laughs> it won't go asleep the way this doctors doing it but that's the one thing that i've been trying to figure out because we're all going to this completely blind i've never raised a kid i've never been around an infant but everybody's already done and says your instincts are just going to take over but it is nice to have some kind of information in your back pocket to go over it yeah i mean I, there there's so much information out there you know i've i'm almost done with my first book and my wife uh, has probably read like four or five by now. <laughs> so I'm just trying to catch up. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, it's an exciting time. And I don't know how you two feel, but we're, we're kind of wishing the baby was already here at this point. It's a pretty swell time to get to quarantine, but we're ready. And I'm sure you well, are. I, I'm glad the baby is not here because my crib hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> Shopping for uh, baby stuff during a pandemic is really interesting. So it's just all online shopping now. No going to the store, checking it out. And normal things that, especially dealing with like Amazon and Ikea, the shipping is not nearly as efficient as it used to be. Understandably so, because there are things we ordered for the baby, cribs and stuff like that. That's, the crib took about three weeks and we're still waiting on more stuff to come and there are some things that I could have sworn I bought before that were on prime and no longer are. And I guess it's the new normal or new reality as they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's different, but you know, once, once all that stuff comes in, you know, once we get, we get the room set up, all, I, you know, we're really excited. You know, it's a really, it's a really cool time. Um, Especially when you're still, as they say, young and you have some energy left because you're going to definitely need it. <laughs> you're young. I feel old. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're, we're close. Close in age. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting 
as the we get older and we progress and there's just more and more children involved in our little microcosm family that we have especially when they're actually humans who can have their own thoughts and consciousness and it's gonna be fun yeah I, I'm excited for our kids to get to play together at uh, Revivalist Barbecues. Yeah, they, we won't need to get a sitter for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I don't know, but it's, I'm kind of glad, to be honest, that we don't have kids yet at a certain age where they could essentially become germaphobes for their entire lives because of this. There's a whole, I was listening to NPR about just the psychology of the pandemic for people that aren't really old enough to really understand what's going on except that they can't see their friends or go anywhere and it's hard to explain to them the phenomenon that's happening right now so yeah i mean you know everything we go through affects us especially at a young age um so it, it's you know it's it affects me it's going to affect people from different ages in different ways but you know if 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 the one takeaway is uh we all now wash our hands a lot more often, and uh, that'll be pretty great. I think um, people are just trying to be far more receptive to cleanliness, which um, in some cultures apparently isn't as important as others, but we're taking it a day at a time. And I don't know what's going on in your neighborhood, but the majority of people around my neighborhood are are trying to be receptive to the stay at home and most everybody wears a mask when they go outside. So everybody you're doing your part, you know? Uh, yeah. So, but there's nothing else we can do except kind of keep through, but I'm hoping, let's see, it's the 23rd. I'm hoping by May 13th, at least in the region, it will be okay. I actually saw a graph of the university of Washington put out when they think certain states should release their stay at home and Louisiana was like in the top 80%. It was like the second wave of states that should be able to get off it. Is that completely factual and true? Who knows? But it gave me some glimmer of hope. Yeah. I'll, uh, you know, I can't wait to go out too, but you know, I'm gonna listen to the doctors and uh, listen to the mayor and listen to the governor and, and do whatever they say. Um, you know, I, I know, I know people that have had it, you know, uh, my wife works in the hospital. Um, she has been lucky enough to, you know, uh, ha still be working at the hospital, but she hasn't worked directly with any COVID patients yet. Um, but still, you know, it's, it's a, it's a rough time for the people in the hospital. They're, they're doing a great job. They're put it, they're risking themselves, you know, they're all catching it and then having to get sick and then having to be sick and having to deal with that hopefully fight through it. And then the people that fight through it are going right back to work. So, you know, uh, the true heroes of this are definitely the healthcare industry and everybody who, while yeah. we're, some people aren't at work like us and we're kind of just figuring out what we're doing. They've never been working harder. So, and it's not yeah. like they're getting raises or bonuses or anything like that. They're just doing their job. Yep. They're showing up and getting it done. But what uh, what else have you been listening to anything recently, or any movies you've been, or any food you've been binging? Oh yeah, uh, I've been eating all of the food. Yeah. I did. We did a we did a Hello Fresh kick, and now we're kind of like done with that. We stopped doing that. We're like, you're kind of tired of like having to choose our meals a week in advance. Oh, I get that. Uh, and then, but I've been cooking a lot because um, I'm home all day, um, so. I've been cooking a lot, been watching some TV, uh, reading the dad books, playing a lot of Rocket League and Mario Kart. Uh, one thing to like help them shut their brain off and video games definitely is one for me that I just recently got back into. And I don't feel bad about playing that like an hour a day. <laughs> so where before this, I probably would feel bad about playing every day, but now I don't. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of I bought I so playing too. I was like, all right. Yeah, I the last system I owned uh, was a was an N sixty four. That's a great. And, that's yeah, 
PlayStation. I traded it for an N64. That was the last system I owned until I bought a Nintendo Switch. And I bought it because I think Ed had one and Rob had one. And we could play Mario Kart with each other on the plane via Bluetooth. Yeah. And I think that was before Smash Brothers had come out, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was before Smash. And then we played Smash Brothers, playing like Smash Brothers and Mario Party on the bus. But what I've been doing is I've been like getting on a little Discord chat uh, and playing like Mario Kart or Rocket League with friends of mine. So it's like a good way to stay in touch. Yeah. That's- one thing I've noticed people seem to be far more receptive to communicating with each other more so than they were before, whether it's through Zoom hangs or Google hangs or any, any excuse to, to see people that you would normally get to see. Um, I know like I've been having different hangs with like my parents on Easter and certain family members and stuff like that, where I was unaware that some of them even knew how to use FaceTime. And now we're talking that way. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's nice to kind of push the envelope in that technology direction where everybody is now acquiring skills that before they didn't know how to use. And hopefully after this is all said and done, we'll still get to uh, like FaceTime your aunt and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, my, my grandma started using Facebook uh, and she's in her 80s. <laughs> She she got a Facebook account because her church was streaming on Facebook Live, Funny. and then she started friend requesting all of her like <laughs> grandkids. Yeah, it was great. Was the, the same thing. He was I call her on a Sunday, and I could hear like chanting in the background, and she's watching service on her computer <laughs> and it's playing. It's like, oh man, I never thought I'd see that day, but. But yeah, like 12-year-old me be like, we don't have to go to church now. We can just listen at the house. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, every, everybody's house is their church now. Uh, yeah. I mean, my, my dad, uh, this is interesting. I'm, I'm curious what y'all, your family did for Easter. Uh, we did a little bit of a, like a Google hang for about 45 minutes. For me, like... Even though, like, my dad and my, my dad's Greek, but my mom converted to Greek Orthodox, but we still, on my mom's side, they're all Catholic. So, with the two separate Easter's being on two different calendar days, two Sundays ago, we had like a big family uh, Zoom where my mom's one of seven. So, I think we had like almost 40 people out there, which was terrible with all the baby boomers. <laughs> they didn't know how to talk on it properly so we ended up having a smaller cousin one later and then my mom actually liked it so much this past sunday me her and my brother ended up uh doing a little zoom chat but you know it's it's weird when you're supposed to be around family for certain times and you're not but we're making the best of it and i keep telling this to a lot of people i talk to i'd be a little bit more scared and freaked out if this was only happening to me or a small group of people but the fact that it's happening to everybody makes me uh, stomach it a little easier. I don't know about yeah, that. I mean, like I'm, I'm still scared, you know. But yeah, that's normal. That's okay. going through something. We're still going through it with everybody else. So, like everybody is going through a similar thing. Um, obviously, to different extents. You know, I'm really lucky. I still have a house. I still have food on the table. Not to try and compare what we're going through to somebody who's dealing with something a little bit more difficult. Yeah, there are a lot of people that are going through. Know, having a really rough time right now but you know we're all you know but we are doing this together it's something that affects absolutely everyone on earth yeah, so yeah. you know it, think about it, it. It, it you know hopefully this will bring us together who knows i think i've been seeing a lot of like memes and things on the internet where they're talking about how mother earth needed a little bit of a reset and this is definitely helping it because you're looking at shots of like Mexico City and Shanghai and LA that are usually just riddled with light pollution and smog and stuff and it's crystal clear which is kind of like freakish because it's never happened in the past I don't know since like the industrial revolution these places have just had really bad uh, issues with air and things like that so I'm, I'm hoping we're just taking this time to realize that maybe we don't necessarily need to rely on this stuff nearly as much as we thought we did yeah i mean uh 
the the climate change issues you know and the the environmental environmental issues have never gone away yeah. uh but it's it's really interesting to you know have have visual concrete proof of the effect we've been having and what effect you know everything stops has on stuff and it, it's also really nice to like you know there it's really nice to like look you know for the silver lining in, in the situation yeah, I think you kind of have to, because if not, you're going to start losing your sanity a little bit. And I lost my sanity a while ago, but <laughs> look like you've been showering and taking care of yourself and doing all right. Yeah, I look like I've been showering. <laughs> I guess um, I don't know. This is something you'll be able to tell your grandkids about one day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just hope we get to get back together soon and make some music and uh, make some music remotely and kind of kind of do this thing. As the, the social distance layers get removed more and more, it's going to be interesting to see how all that shakes out to where, okay, we can get eight of us in a room and then maybe after eight, it's 50 and then 100 and we'll, we'll see where it goes, but we'll be there anxiously waiting to play that's for sure yeah so but all right mike this was this was a fun test run good, good chatting with you it's fun test run of the uh the george geekus interviews <laughs> it needs a better name than that but i didn't think about that but yeah we will uh we'll definitely do another one the, the zoom let, let's let's brainstorm some some uh some titles yeah, hopefully by the time this actually comes out i can re-record a name and like intro the, stuff over it the zoom interviews with george uh live from george's house my house so. i don't know <laughs> well good talking to you george bye mike